Okay, for part three of this week's material in class, I'm going to look at the ideas and work of Pierre Bourdieu, who emphasises the cultural and symbolic dimensions of class. So as you see in the explanations that I'm about to, to give, um, Bourdieu brings together um, aspects of uh, both Marx and Weber's understanding of class and a whole um, realm of other thinkers as well, um, sociologists and philosophers. Uh, Bourdieu's initial training was in philosophy. Um, Bourdieu is particularly interested in, in how social class and how inequality generally is reproduced intergenerationally and through institutions. So again, the economic is very important here. Those with more economic and material resources have all kinds of advantages. But what Bourdieu wants to emphasise as well is that that kind of material hierarchy also corresponds with uh, symbolic and cultural resources, um, what uh, Bourdieu refers to as forms of capital, and I'll go through some examples of those in a minute. Like Weber, though, uh, the, the, the different important forms of capital that people use in their day-to-day -day lives to you know, um, do well in, in their work or in their leisure practices or whatever... They don't wholly determinedly map onto to money. What Bourdieu points out is there are people with lots of economic capital but mightn't have you know higher levels of cultural capital. Some people with cultural capital have relatively low levels of economic capital, um, and these things kind of make a more complex picture of how class works. One of Bourdieu's most prominent and influential concepts is the idea of habitus. Habitus is a concept to think about how we are in the world, um, a kind of un unconscious way of being, or a way of embodying uh, class in, many, in, in the way that Bourdieu understands things. In a way, habitus is the way that class is played out and performed in day-to-day -day practices by individuals. And how do we do this? Well, we kind of learn socially developed dispositions. Dispositions are a really important term for Bourdieu. Dispositions being the way that we kind of feel safe or unsafe in a particular situation, the way we might feel comfortable or uncomfortable, the way that we'll interpret various things differently to those around us based on our own socialisation. So Bourdieu doesn't use the term socialisation that much. He talks about dispositions and therefore we carry around this kind of habitus. And habitus is this kind of mechanism within us, this kind of antenna, I suppose, that... Um, um, we uh, have constantly kind of going as we move through our day-to-day -day lives, as we move through different social situations, and this kind of um, affects the way that we perform ourselves in those situations. And again, you can hear echoes of Goffman um, that we've looked at in previous weeks. So habitus is essentially is a kind of feel for the game is the, um, is the terminology that um, is often quoted about Bourdieu on what habitus is a way of thinking, feeling, and being in the world. For Bourdieu, our class background has a real influence on what our habitus is. For Bourdieu, basically people from different backgrounds, from different upbringings, um, have different levels of economic, cultural, and um, social capital is another form of capital that he talks about as well. Now, there are, are kind of ways that people try and measure this stuff, and certainly, certainly economic capital, you know, like wealth can be measured, you know, and how big your house is and where it is and all that kind of stuff. So economic capital in that sense is very much like the Marx version that I was talking on, talking about in early parts of the lecture. Um, the important development that Bourdieu makes when thinking about how class works culturally, though, is this idea of cultural capital. In this sense, class takes on embodied, objectified and institu institutional forms and we all possess different levels of those things. So examples of this for something like objectified forms of capital is how many books are in the household. Um, there's a bunch of different studies have shown that you can pretty much plot like um, educational success, um, plots on very closely to how many uh, books are in the house. And sometimes it doesn't seem to matter even what the books are. Now, why does this matter? Well, having access to books normalizes reading and reading is something that's really important in education. So you can see they're having books in the household will then influence someone's embodied cultural capital, that is the kind of acceptance and acknowledgement and even normalisation 
that reading is something that everyone should do. Um, so embodied cultural capital, I think, is the most important one because it relates to that habitus of how you think and feel and, and do things in particular situations, how you feel comfortable. It's a kind of advantageous attribution where um, it seems that things, um, people are making the right choices and, um, you know, uh, putting their kind of, um, their um, motivations and things into practice. But for Bourdieu, this isn't just kind of a case of meritocracy where people are making the right decisions and are talented. What embodied cultural capital tends to reflect is the already privileged and tends to not reflect the disadvantaged. So, you know, middle class men, white men, tend to have advantages in institutions. Why? Because the demands in those institutions tend to reflect the kind of so-called natural, in inverted commas, um, way that, that natural dispositions that they entail. Um, cultural capital, in this sense, is a kind of way of thinking deeply about how culture is hierarchical. Um, it isn't meritocracy. It isn't just a thing about leisure and pleasure, or it isn't just about, um, you know, a way of life per se. Um, if you think about culture through the lens of cultural capital, we'll see that some ways of life, some lifestyles, some ways of being are advantaged over others. So the other key Another key um, concept that Bourdieu develops is the idea of fields. So importantly here, this is a kind of methodological device for sociologists to do research with. And it's kind of the acknowledgement in a way that as individuals, we don't take part in all of society all at once. Really, the way that we practice in day-to-day -day life is within what Bourdieu called social fields. So we practice in the field of consumption when we just choose what television show or music we want to listen to. We go to work and we're therefore practicing in the labor market and that might be in the field of education. So these are kind of different arenas of struggle that we're all embedded in. But importantly, we're not embedded in all of them. I mean, I'm not a politician, so I'm not really embedded in the field of struggle in politics or, or whatever. So what Bourdieu then shows is that different levels of economic and cultural capital um, increase the chances of people entering into some fields over others. And then once in the field, those cultural resources, those capitals, play a role in, you know, who can be um, successful, um, who is seen as cool, who is seen as right, who is seen as moral, um, all these different things that may be um, part of the hierarchy of being doing well in a particular field tend to be then um, related back to those capitals. So education, again, is a good example to, to unpack this. Um, and Bourdieu's work was um, developed with some um, really influential studies about the French education system. Um, so, you know, a middle-class kid who has relatively well-educated um, parents will come into the education system much more comfortable with that. You know, they've seen their parents, you know, maybe studying, there'll be books in the household. Their parents might also have a kind of positive orientation towards education and, you know, be helping their kids and all that kind of stuff. Within the household, Therefore, there's a kind of embodied cultural capital that in, has a kind of healthy disposition towards the education systems. Kids from more working class backgrounds whose you know, parents might have only went to year 10 that have uh, work in more manual labour where education isn't required as much, have a more what's called a social distance from education. Now note here that like all kids have to go to school. What we're talking about here in the social distance though is the kind of... Um, orientation towards the norms and demands of that field are more distant from what's normal for kids from disadvantaged backgrounds. From this Borgesian perspective, kids from disadvantaged backgrounds have to go into education systems that tend to be middle-class institutions, that is, the people working in them and setting the goals, making the curriculum, being the disciplinaries, uh, disciplinarians, have middle-class backgrounds and largely then reinforce middle-class values. The kid from the working class background then has to come into this place and learn to be someone else. So there's a social distance between their own lifestyle and way in life and what's demanded of them in this institution. For Bourdieu, this is how all different social fields work. Art, the law, academia, politics, business, science, media. If we treat all these things as fields, they'll have similar hierarchical things going on where different forms of capital are needed in them to be successful. I and mean, not everyone um, has equal access to those capitals. What this means is some people are more predisposed to being successful in particular fields. 
or even being able to enter a particular field. And this for Bourdieu is how inequality works at that cultural level. So importantly here, this reinforces a class system because people then get to be, you know, the ones who define, you know, in the future, what is right and wrong, what's legal and illegal, what's tasteful and vulgar, which therefore really kind of keeps constantly reinforcing this kind of middle class, well-educated point of view. So in terms of this idea of cultural and um, economic capital, in some of Bourdieu's uh, studies and others that are influenced by him, they kind of produce these maps where different practices um, or different people can be you know, plotted on these maps. Now, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of these maps because they're somewhat misrepresentative, I think, of what Bourdieu is on about. It makes everything look static in this kind of system that kind of doesn't move. Um, so if we look at something like this, which is a, a mapping on different um, food and eating practices on who has more economic capital and cultural capital, more or less, um, it's important to remember that this would be a snapshot at a particular time whenever this research was done, and if you looked at this five or ten years later, different things might move around. But here we can kind of then start associating things in pop culture and consumer culture with different classes, those with high economic and low cultural, you know, high cultural, low economic, tend to, in this Borgesian analysis, have similar tastes and congregate around different um, cultural practices. And again, this is important when we think about how cultural capital is made and remade. So, you know, much of the work that Bourdieu did in the really classic study distinction showed how people from relatively privileged backgrounds have similar tastes. They tended to like opera and literature. People from more disadvantaged backgrounds are more in, um, um, likely to be consuming pop culture. Again, you could see how that could be reinforced in terms of disadvantage in the school system when it tends to be more high culture that is taught in those realms, particularly when Bourdieu was doing this research. So I've used this little kind of quote a bit throughout the course. Um, here, in terms of thinking about how culture plays a role in how class reinforces um, inequality, the idea that taste classifiers and it classifies the classifier is an important kind of relational way of thinking about this. For Bourdieu, social subjects, people, distinguish themselves by the distinctions that they make between the beautiful and the ugly, the distinguished and the vulgar, in which their position in the objective classifications is expressed and betrayed, or all betrayed. So the objective classifications there is kind of that, you know, economic class system, but this tends to be then reflected in this more cultural and symbolic level. Again, importantly though, it's not, from Bourdieu's perspective here, He's not necessarily saying that some things are more high class and better than other things. Um, importantly here, he sees much of culture as being arbitrary. The hierarchies that we then place on things as being better or worse, tasteful or vulgar, good or bad, moral or immoral, are a, more a reflection of the hierarchical system mapping onto cultural capital. Examples of this is kind of in food, you know, like the filet mignon is seen as more kind of tasteful than like the T-bone, even though they're just different cuts of meat. Um, the argument here would be that they're just reflecting various kind of experts or various tastes rather than having some, kind of some, you know, objective intrinsic value of one being better than the other. Um, we can kind of extend this out to kind of make the normal look strange when it comes to different hierarchies of pop culture, you know, that, you know, Shakespeare is better than, I don't know, the TV show Sex Education or something, right? Um, again, there's kind of hierarchies built into experts reflecting their own tastes and then, you know, classifying things in the canon as opposed to things being in pop culture as being seen as um, uh, spectacular or vulgar or whatever. So what this leads to, and in, in what I think is Bourdieu's most important concept, is the idea of symbolic violence. Those that lack cultural capital, um, that are kind of um, impelled to go into situations where their own way of life and tastes are not reflected back at them, experience what Bourdieu calls symbolic violence. This is kind of a feeling of denigration, of, um, of oppression, um, where the disadvantaged often then feel like they're not welcome in particular spaces, and then, importantly, uh, reject those spaces and exclude themselves from it. A good example is this is something like museum attendance, it's largely done by middle-class people, uh, research shows that people from working class backgrounds tend to feel excluded from those places because, um, you know, 
they're made to feel that they don't necessarily legitimately understand the art in, in, in what the in the way that the institution deems is the right way. So this symbolic violence then is a kind of way of thinking about how inequality feels. Um, the kid in, you know, the working class kid in a middle class school is going to feel um, denigrated, feel shameful, feel guilty, and this will have profound effects on their economic performance, uh, on their educational performance. So this kind of symbolic violence, how some people have more cultural power and recognition over others, um, works through misrecognition. The idea that there's kind of hierarchies of things, but really they're much more arbitrary, as I was explaining in the um, slide before. Symbolic violence is particularly enacted through the use of language, the use and control of language. And we can see this through examples that we've used in the course already. Um, you know, the developing versus the developed world. The developed world seen as being the highest part of the hierarchy. The developing needs to kind of catch up. And, you know, the first and third world almost are ranking there. Um, you know, I've talked about the Bogan as a kind of symbolically violent class marker. We can think about this with kind of, you know, things about the dole bludger and stuff as well. Now, notice something like the idea of the dole bludger has nothing to really to do with the reality of a labour market where there's like literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people either out of work or underemployed every week, but only tens of thousands of jobs available. They seem to need these kind of denigration categories to scapegoat people that are um, really more systematic problems. The term boat people is another good example. These are refugees um, leaving you know, countries because of war and persecution. Um, and the idea of boat people kind of is then put up against some kind of legitimate refugee that can kind of have the means to maybe fly out here or something. So, again, the language oriented towards someone like a refugee is kind of covered up. It covers up their actual situation um, by using those kind of labels. Another example is just the way the word ethnic is used in our media. It's always used to kind of symbolise a minority group, when ethnic isn't about majority or minorities. Ethnic is just a terminology to describe, you know, different groups of people uh, on their, in terms of their traditions and, and things like that. So and that's something we'll talk about in some detail in, in another part of the course. So our language in this sense is imbued with symbolic violence where it actually, again, language represents some people's points of view and some people's lives and some people's wants and needs over others and this therefore um, creates a symbolic and cultural hierarchy that maps onto class. Okay, I'll leave um, Bourdieu there and I'll come back and talk about um, aspects of class in the contemporary world.